Kelly Guest, be my guest, be my guest. I'm sure nobody has ever done that for you before. <laughs> not too many people, actually, and at least not as well as you are doing it. Oh, well, thank you. I used to be on the national tour of Beauty and the Beast, so I sang that song literally thousands of times. <laughs> wow, my girls would be so jealous. I did not know this about you. Oh, that's so just Yes, in my former life, I was a <laughs> touring actress. It was a lot of fun. But yeah, thank you for being my guest on Called and Caffeinated. And now hopefully no one will ever forget your name after hearing that <laughs> intro. Uh, you wrote a book called, called Saintly Moms, which is amazing and inspiring. It's from Our Sunday Visitor. And it's, you want to just tell us uh, real quick what the book is about? Well, of, I go. chose 25 mommy saints um, to write about because um, I, I had three children in three years in one day. And uh, one I could handle, two was a little challenging. By three, I felt it was total chaos, and I felt like I was doing it all wrong. So I started reading um, stories about saints who were in my situation and survived, not only survived, but thrived. And um, somewhere around three or four books into it, I thought, you know what, I'm going to start taking notes. And one day, um, when I finish raising my children, I will write this book because surely other moms probably need the same encouragement and inspiration that I, I need. So yes. uh, that's how it came about. That is so beautiful. And I will say, I know we, so for our, my audience, so it's not all mothers. So if you are not a mother and you're listening to this, if you're not even a woman and you're listening to this, you're a man, you still listen because uh, we're actually going to be talking about the virtues exemplified by these saints who also happen to be mothers. And the, the book is definitely a wonderful encouragement for, for mothers. But for our discussion today, we're going to be talking about the virtues that they exemplified. Um, and some of these women are just, they're all extraordinary in their own way. But I particularly love the ones who were just heroic in their courage and their example. And it's like, oh, and then they were a mom on top of that. <laughs> um, exactly. Yes, many of them were martyrs. So I am so excited to dive in. Um, but I just want to ask you, uh, what are you drinking today? Do you have a beverage? So I have um, hot chocolate protein. It's kind of like a protein shake, but hot. So that makes it even better in the wintertime. Oh, but I kind of spoil it by putting marshmallows in there. So it's not as quite as healthy <laughs> as it probably should be because I added my mini marshmallows. Hey, no guilt. That is so awesome. <laughs> what a great idea. Thank you for your commitment to the caffeinated aspect of this, of this show. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> you got it. So what questions have you received from God in your life so far? And what has receiving those calls looked and felt like for you? Cool. So um, I guess, obviously, um, I, motherhood, right? And um, to be an author, which actually was a dream of mine. And I was, before I was a mom of nine children, I actually was in the convent for five years. So um, I felt that calling um, also. So all of these um, different things that God placed on my heart at different times and um, gave me the courage to say yes to those desires. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, th those are the things that, uh, yeah, that uh, he gave me to be able to do. Um, and I learned so much from each one of those things that um, he has put in my life. Yes. I love how you said in the introduction to your book that you thought that being a mother would be way easier than it actually <laughs> was. And then once you got there, you realized how hard it was. And I feel like coming from a former nun, that's actually really validating <laughs> for all of us mothers. Yes. Um, and I'd love to hear just a little bit more kind of the Reader's Digest version of your call to the convent and then your call away from the convent we focus on a lot of areas of discernment in this ministry, but I feel like it's so fun to listen to different vocational discernment stories just because they're all so different. God calls us all so differently. Yeah. The vocation stories are one of my favorite things to hear and everybody has a vocation, right? So it's always wonderful to hear. So mine works out to the point where um, I always thought about being a sister. And when I was a junior in high school, I looked into convents as well as colleges, but nothing did, that I really felt called to. Um, mm -hmm. So I went to the community college because I really didn't know what God wanted me to do. My second year in a community college, the Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia, who are in Nashville, Tennessee, came and took over our all-girls school, right in my neighborhood, pretty much. Um, and I fell in love with them. I mean, they wore the long white Dominican habit with the black veil. And they exuded such joy 
that I was immediately attracted. And uh, that May, I went down to visit the mother house. It was a little piece of heaven on earth. Mm. And um, mother gave me permission to enter that August. So I entered um, uh, for the first two years, it's novitiate year. So unlike, you know, married life where you get to watch your parents live it out, uh, religious life, you really have no idea what you're getting yourself into. So the first two years are, um, I, I was free to leave at any time. You're mm. learning the life and you're learning what it means to um, profess the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, learning a lot about the Catholic faith and different doctrines. Um, at the end of those two years, I made vows, the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience for three years. And um, I finished up my education. I taught eighth grade one year. My last year in the convent, I taught fifth grade. And um, along with that, I started having the desire to get married. And it was really difficult because I loved religious life. And I thought it was Satan testing me and tempting me because my vows were coming up again. And um, so I just started praying in all earnestness that God would take away that temptation. And I even went to mother um, somewhere around Christmas and, and shared with her my struggles. And she assured me, God um, will give you the graces you need to fulfill those vows. You promised three years. Mm -hmm. So continue doing what you're doing. Continue to pray. Get up every morning. Live the life the best you can. And come and talk to me again when it's closer to the time for you to renew vows. So I did exactly that. Continued to pray. But about two weeks before my vows were up, I um, went to mother and I said, I I've been praying. I'm begging God to take away these temptations, but Satan just won't leave me alone. And she says, not Satan, it's God. And Stacy, the, the movement of grace that came, that, that weight of the world that you sometimes feel was lifted. And um, I knew it was time to go home and see what else God had in mind for me. So I called mm -hmm. my parents and they got me a plane ticket to come on home. And about three weeks later, I met my husband. <laughs> oh, Wow. <laughs> Yeah. That must have been hard to leave, but also how exciting. How long before you met your husband did you know that you were called to get married? Um, well, I, I knew when I left the convent that it was because it was God's will that I not be a sister and that I would get married. And the funny thing about it is I, I told God, um, I told God I don't ever want to teach fifth grade again, and I won't <laughs> fall in love with the first man I married. So, I mean, the first man I met, I won't fall in love with him. But I pretty much fell in love with the first man I met. <laughs> and, and my first job offer was to teach fifth grade. <laughs> so I ended up teaching wow. fifth grade and falling. So don't ever tell God what you will and won't do <laughs> because uh, he has a way of letting you eat your words. <laughs> Amen to that. What a fascinating journey for you. And I'm sure, did you find that your years in religious life helped form you to be a, a wife and a mother? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, I don't think entering the convent was a mistake. I, I know that it was all part of God's plan because in the convent, mm. I learned so much about self-sacrificial love. Mm. I learned what it means to obey. Um, you know, as in like, I don't mean like, I'm, you know, obeying every little thing my husband does. Lord knows I still struggle with that sometimes, but that, that, that freedom that comes from um, doing what's best for the community or in this case for my family, you know, and being open to um, things that I think I don't want to do, but it's what's best for our family, you know? So I learned a lot of that in the comment and just even about my faith. Uh, I, um, I grew up in the era after Vatican council too. So um, a lot of us didn't get um, our faith taught to us very well. And um, mm. in the convent, I, I was blessed with great parents who did. My father sat down with me with Baltimore Catechism and had me memorizing <laughs> those questions and all that. But it all came together in the convent. Mm. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it all was part of God's plan. Um, every th moment there, um, I learned something that has helped me as a wife and a mother. Of course, I think my husband would say that I probably could have used a couple more years <laughs> to learn a little bit better. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, no, I, I, and I know it was all part of God's plan. I, mm. I, I think it helped save my soul. I, re I really do. I think those years there um, kept me on the straight and narrow and helped me grow closer to God instead of moving further away from him. Absolutely. So, I'm yeah. so grateful. Thank you for sharing that. I feel like we could do a drinking game on this podcast where every time <laughs> Stacy encourages people to 
discern religious life, we take a shot. (laughs) I seriously have encouraged this so many times on my podcast, but I even just did an Ascension Presents uh, series. Um, Three out of the four videos have been released. I'm sure by this time, by the time this video is released, um, all four videos will be out. But one of them I dedicated to just encouraging young people to just think about it. Just go research some orders online, make some phone calls, find out who would invite you on a discernment retreat and then go because who knows what is going to happen. And it's been said at every single guest that I have, I don't know what they're going to say before I ask this question, but often I will, if they have been in religious life, I'll say, what did you learn? And they'll say, oh, it was the best thing I ever did, even if they were called to a different vocation ultimately. And that's true in my life too, with my discernment journey. So thank you for sharing that. I hope that empowers oh, people who might be scared to just kind of dip their toes in the water to just, just think about it, just go for it. Um, yeah. And it, you know, and if you're not meant to be there, um, then God will redirect your steps like he did for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like they should be a draft for religious life. <laughs> Every young Catholic should yes. be two years. <laughs> I know. I hear you. I'm like, why not give God first option in your life? You know, right. you're always going to belong to him, but why not give him the first, you know, the, yeah. Like you said, the first draft pick. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let's get into some of the beautiful saints in your book and um, you have 25 saints. There's no way we can cover all of them, but I wanted to focus on uh, the ones who exemplified particular virtues that I believe that we need to live out nowadays. And also the ones who were a little bit less well-known. So I know there's, you know, St. Elizabeth of Hungary, the Blessed Virgin Mother, B- Blessed Virgin Mary, um, St. Anne, everybody has at least heard their names, but some of these I have never even heard their names and I am not even sure I'm going to pronounce them correctly. <laughs> so uh, the first one it exemplifies uh, courage and it is St. Perpetua. She is one that we hear at mass every Sunday. So we probably are at least familiar with her name, but may not be familiar with the fact that she was a martyr and the fact that she actually had a newborn son that she was nursing while she was in prison just before she was executed, which makes my heart just like drop (laughs) thinking about that, saying goodbye to your son and knowing you'll never see him again on the side of heaven. So even though she was, you know, in this position in her life, she was still called to to the cross of martyrdom. So you could just tell us a little bit more, any other details you'd like to fill in about her story and what we can learn from her about courage. I think St. Perpetua knew who she was. I'm a Christian. And if that means that I have to die, then I trust in God's mercy and goodness that he will take care of my son. Um, I have no doubt. I'm sure she had no doubt that God would do that for her if she was faithful to him. And she knew whose she was. I am God's. My son is God's. And so I... Um, we're going to be fine, you know, and uh, um, God blessed her with vision of, of heaven. So that probably helps too. Um, we probably will never have that kind of vision, but we know that we can't even begin to imagine how beautiful heaven is. Mm-hmm. And if we keep our eyes on that goal on, on heaven, then we will have the courage to do the difficult things that God may ask of us. I, I don't know that we would ever be called to, die for our faith like saint perpetua did but we're called in many little ways to die to ourselves Mm -hmm. and uh, it takes courage in those little things too Uh, especially my children you know with with choosing friends Um, i homeschool until high school and then i send them to the public school to let their light shine in a dark place and so um it's hard for them sometimes to find friends Uh, and sometimes they think they find friends and then have to let them go Um, Mm -hmm. and that takes courage and so that, that comes from knowing whose you are. I belong to God and uh, I know that he's going to take care of me no matter what it may feel like. And so I think that's St. Perpetua's lesson for us, that we can be courageous um, even in the midst of uh, great difficulty because mm-hmm. God will give us the grace and the courage that we need to step up when he's called us. I love that. Yeah. 
Hey friends, I'm hopping in here really quick to just give you a couple of super quick announcements. The first one is that for the first time in a year and a half, I have opened up my True North discernment course. What is True North, you may ask? Well, I wrote it in 2020 and we had a group from 13 different countries around the world move through the course then, but it's been closed ever since. It's a discernment course, which is self-paced. There are five modules with videos, worksheets, and coaching from me. So you get a lot of support. It's basically the course that I wish I had had when I was just concerning my vocation, school, jobs, relationships, everything. There is no Personhood 101 course, and I feel like there should be, and so I wrote it. <laughs> so uh, it's a wonderful course. You get a ton of material, and I encourage you to go check it out by going to stacysummerow.com slash shop, and you can go ahead and see if it's right for you. When you sign up for True North, you also get included with it the 44 God's Adventure Awaits Summit Talks, which uh, is... A, I mean, the smartest people I've ever met, like Mary Lenneberg and Father Mark Goring and Sister Bethany Madonna, people with amazing spiritual lives who are there to help guide you on your discernment journey. You'll also get a catalog of 56 mission organizations and religious communities. So if you are discerning your vocation, that's an additional bonus that you get thrown in for free to help match you with the right community or organization for you. So head on over to stacysummerow.com shop, and I will be sure to put that link in the show notes for you. Also, uh, you may or may not have seen that on this channel, I have a workout series called Catholic Strong. I just added two new videos. Do check out that series. There's plenty there for you to use. And of course it's free. So just head on over there after this interview's over. Finally, but not least, I wanna thank this video's sponsor, which is Catholic Match. Now, if you are a regular follower, you know that my husband and I also, um, were sponsored by Catholic Match for our marriage. <laughs> so that's how we met. We talk about it all the time. Online dating is totally the norm nowadays, but I know that a lack of an established etiquette can sometimes make it feel overwhelming or discouraging. It can make it difficult to connect with that one special person. So I love that Catholic Match cares enough to put a lot of advice in their blogs as well as their Instagram account, which I'll be sure to link in the show notes for you. And they really wanna help guide their members towards a happy and a holy and a healthy marriage. And they have other great resources coming up that I wish I could tell you about, but I can't yet. But anyway, I love that Catholic Map doesn't just want to throw you in on the deep end, but included with your membership comes the, all of this guidance over on their, their blog. So you can also win a free six month subscription. You'll be automatically entered for that drawing when you join using my specific link, which is catholicmatch.com slash called and caffeinated. I will put that in the show notes. Just make sure you join before March 15th because that's when the drawing will happen. All right, now let's get back to our show. Another one who is an extremely, this woman was so strong. Uh, and she, to me, exemplifies faith, uh, St. Bassa or Bassa. Yes. Bassa. She, St. Bassa, uh, she home, you know, what? I'll just let you tell her story and why she exemplified faith. So, and whatever you want to share about what we can do to strengthen our faith like she did. Okay. So St. Bassa's story is similar to the mother of Maccabees that we just read. Mm -hmm. Um, so she had, um, three sons. She was married, um, to a pagan. Um, this is only about third century, um, AD. So, um, during the persecution under the Roman emperors, um, and her own husband finds out that she is Christian and has been raising her children, their sons as Christians. And he turns her in to the emperor and, and as well as her sons. And so, um, they were given every opportunity to make sacrifice to the Roman gods, which they would not do. And so one by one, her sons were tortured and, and killed. And she was made to witness it in hopes that that would encourage her to just make the sacrifice so you can live too, or else this and worse is going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. and, and she just encouraged her sons to remain strong. And she herself ended up, uh, they made three attempts on her life and she never, she never um, suffered death from, uh, from the attempts on her mm -hmm. life. Um, eventually they just kind of throw her out in the ocean <laughs> and, and um, she washes ashore. Um, actually the story goes that um, a, a, a boat came up upon her and uh, three men were on that boat and pulled her aboard. Uh, and many believe that those three men were her sons. Um, but she does eventually 
reached shore where she was beaten to death. Um, so she does ultimately suffer martyrdom herself. Um, but how does a mother watch her sons tortured and know that that torture is going to lead to their death um, if it wasn't for faith, that, that trust that God will fulfill his promise that if I just remain faithful, and that's what she keeps telling them, just remain faithful and God will be faithful to you, um, to just have that absolute trust in God that um, this is not the end, but just the beginning. And these men who are torturing us um, are making us more like Christ so that we can see him. Mm. Um, what, what, um, also courage, like St. Perpetua, all the martyrs, but, but that faith, to know that we are headed somewhere better. Um, and so for however long that this uh, pain and suffering um, it is called, uh, put upon us, it's nothing compared to the time that we'll spend in eternity with God. So uh, she found the strength to be able to watch her son die because of her great faith that God is faithful to his promises. Her story was one of the ones where I had to put down the book and really think about it afterward. And there were a number of those in this book. That was, um, that was truly incredible because you always think of laying your life down for your children. And that is way more natural than encouraging your children to lay down their lives for your faith. So yeah, just absolutely incredible. And, and also how beautiful to see that in the moment that they needed that strength, it was given to them. I think that's something that I really underestimate about God (laughs) because I've been through some really difficult things with my daughter this year. And I have to say, you, you do what you have to do. You might feel like you're at the end of your rope. You might feel way, 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 way past the end of your rope, but you do what you have to do in the moment that it is required. And I think that's something that I always used to just discount myself and say, I could never do that. And I think God loves to sort of take us out of, take us into that. I could never do this zone to strengthen our faith and to really show us what we are capable of that we never knew before. Um, I I would have never thought I would be mother of nine. And as a matter of fact, when I was praying in the convent, Lord, I mean, I I truly prayed, just show me what it is that you want me to do. I'll do whatever you ask. And if he said, okay, this is what's going to happen. (laughs) You're going to meet a man. He's not even going to be Catholic, you know, but you're going to raise nine kids. I would have been like, okay, staying right here in the convent. Lord, thanks anyway, (laughs) because it is true, Stacey. He gives us the graces as we need them, not before. So for us to look at St. Basa or St. Perpetua, we don't have those graces. If ever we're called to do that, then he'll give us the graces. Yes. Um, but for right now, but we can do little things so that when and if that moment comes, we'll be able to be faithful. Mm-hmm. So we, we have to be faithful in the small things so that if ever the big things are asked of us, um, God will, will be able to pull us through that and we'll let him because we've let him do it with the little things. Absolutely. And a modern day equivalent of that, I think, is uh, being a Christian in public, because now we all have a platform and now we all can, can speak the truth in a way that does, isn't just limited to our small locality, but it could be quite a, a wide circle and we can choose what we post and what we decide to say. And that's not, I'm not encouraging everybody to go out and start militantly <laughs> telling people their sins online. Cause I don't think that's the right approach, but to be a Christian in every aspect of your life which often will take a lot of courage and which may lead to you getting canceled, which is not, you know, it's not the same as martyrdom, but it is in a sense a martyrdom because you're sacrificing your popularity. And I think a lot of us have a fear of, of disappearing uh, and a fear of being forgotten. And you have to lay that at the Lord's feet when you say something that you know might get you canceled. But I I think that's coming for Christians. I mean, it's already here. It's already here, but it's, it's going to, I think, keep coming in a greater capacity and we get to choose what we, what we share and who we are. And I think all of those little decisions um, and to, to let the Lord sort of take care of you uh, and to show you what he has for you. That's greater than popularity or even appearing nice. You know, a lot of us, I think, want to, want to appear nice, and that's not a virtue. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When my children are, uh, when I'm disciplining them or, you know, sh- 
I want them to speak differently to each other than how they're speaking. I try to say, you know, that's not kind. And I'll say, that's not nice. Just cause like, I'm not, I'm like, nice isn't a virtue. So let's just stick with, this is not kind just to share this, you know, this, this way. Um, and they, that's what they say now they use that word. So um, yeah, yeah. There's, there's more important things than being nice <laughs> is the long and short of it. Beautiful. I, would, yeah. I wish you would have shared with that a long time ago when my kids were still little, but you're right. Kindness is, is the fruit, right? So we Absolutely. have to um, encourage and help that fruit to grow. Niceness is not, you're right. That is not on that tree of fruits of Holy Spirit. <laughs> right. Cause all that means is pleasing other people. And I know uh, there's a lot of shame going around if you don't fall into lockstep with the current uh whatever agenda it is, the things that you're supposed to say in order for people to approve of you. And so just realizing I don't care if somebody, if someone shames me, that's not my main goal in life. And I think, you know, I know I've been praying a lot about that and I'm going to continue to pray a lot about that because it's very easy to get sucked in. Yeah. Um, okay. The next one that I have is really cool. Uh, St. Gladys. And I don't know how to say the names of her children and her husband. They were Welsh, I believe. Right. Yes. It's some really cool pronunciations in there. It's some of them are all consonants. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they were, she and her husband were kind of like a modern day or a, sorry, a pre Bonnie and Clyde, Bonnie and Clyde, not modern day. They lived way, way <laughs> long time ago. So they were like very wicked. They were running around doing all these terrible things and terrorizing people. And then they uh, learned to exemplify the virtue of uh, forgiveness or mercy. Um, which actually technically correct me if I'm wrong. I think forgiveness is a virtue, but mercy is not. Is that correct? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I tried to research this beforehand because I was, I realized I was like, Oh, I should know this. Anyway, we'll just say forgiveness and mercy for people who may have trouble forgiving themselves for their past sins. Uh, what can we learn from them? Yeah. Yeah. For forgiving ourselves is, is sometimes harder than forgiving others, isn't it? So, um, St. Gladys, and thank goodness her husband has like a nickname, Woolis, um, King Woolis. So um, she actually was Christian. She brought up, was brought up Christian. Um, King Woolis was a pagan. He asked for her hand in marriage and the father said, absolutely no, you're not Christian. Mm. And so he just kidnapped her. Um, Woolis kidnapped Gladys. She, typical good girl gone bad story. Um, and you're right. They just terrorized, you know, the, the towns around them. Um, um, at, even to the point of stealing this um, hermit's only source of nutrition, a, a cow. He had a cow um, that he used for milk. And uh, the tenacity of that little monkey went after him. And, and by the time he caught up to him, they had already slaughtered his cow. Mm -hmm. So in reparation, and I guess that Catholic guilt might always stay with you, even if you're wild and crazy, right? <laughs> so um Gladys offers her firstborn son, Kadok. Now, I mean, to us today, we'd be like, what? what? <laughs> um, but that wasn't uncommon in their times because there were no public schools. So especially the wealthy would send their children to monasteries mm. to be educated by monks. So um, this holy monk um, saw the opportunity to educate this young man and at least get him away from the influence of his parents, the bad influence mm -hmm. of his parents. And so he brought him up in the ways of the Lord. And of course, mom misses her son. She goes and visits him. Um, he begins talking to her about the faith and about our Lord. And she begins to listen to him. And the seed that was planted in her baptism that maybe got stunted in its growth begins to get watered again by her son. And so she eventually comes around and, um, and was able to bring her husband into the faith also through the help of her, her um, son. Mm -hmm. and, and I think forgiveness of any type, but especially forgiveness of yourself takes great humility to accept that mercy that's extended to you. And so um, the, the humility that it took for them to learn from their son, you know, to recognize that he was wiser than they were, you know, he knew something that they didn't. I know. And I was going to say that is humility right there. <laughs> yes. And boy, the, don't our children do that to us though. Don't they yes. often teach us things that um, maybe we know, but don't want to accept. 
and they call us out on it, or maybe just a new way of looking or an example that they give us. Um, but but for as for forgiving ourselves, know that um, God is always doing whatever he can to draw us closer to himself. Mm. And um, they spend the rest of their life, um, well, they, they settle down and they do rule their kingdom justly after that. Mm. Um, but when their other sons get old enough, they hand the kingdom over to them and they go off to live a life of penance. Um, Kadok, their son, founded an abbey and um, King Willis goes and lives there. And um, Gladys lives in a little hermitage, uh, um, a little bit on that grounds, but a little bit away. She did kind of things that we might think crazy, um, taking ice cold baths in the river there and such as a form of penance. Mm. And um, I think we have to realize that penance is necessary. Mm. I mean, it's one way, an outward sign of the sorrow that we feel for our sins and a sign that we are truly sorry for what we've done. Mm -hmm. And I think God is pleased when we humble ourselves enough to do a penance mm. to let him know I am truly sorry for what I have done. Mm. And I think that also helps us to accept his mercy, knowing that we are doing something to help make reparation for those things that we have done wrong to help us become detached from those things that have drawn us away from him. And so, um, yeah, she learns in time to come back to her Catholic faith and to, accept the correction from her own son mm -hmm. and to grow closer to our Lord through a life of penance and, and righteous living. Mm. Wow. That's such a cool story. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I love highlighting too how people, like you said, took penance very seriously for us. Mm -hmm. We just have to go to confession and then say some prayers yeah, that often take yeah. five minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But really taking your own sins seriously and then also realizing that while you could never truly atone for them, uh, your penance is enough for God. And therefore, you yes. should let it be enough for yourself as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. The next one is perseverance. And perhaps some of my listeners have undergone uh, some trauma or some kind of abuse. Uh, and it can be so difficult to come back from that. And for that, we have St. Feneva. Did I say her name correctly? Perfect. Yes. <laughs> it's like Geneva, but with a TH at the beginning. And uh, so she was raped and then she was thrown off a cliff when she was pregnant, didn't die, but then she had a long road. She was not allowed to go back home, uh, even though it wasn't her fault that she got pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, and then eventually went on to found the city of Glasgow. <laughs> so quite a journey for her. So can you share a little bit about perseverance and uh, the road to healing and anything else you want about St. Phenema? Okay. So yeah, I mean, her own father um, found her to be such a disgrace that he did have her thrown from a, a 200 foot ledge, right? And when she landed softly, when God guided her down and, and the chair, it was on a chariot. And when she wasn't just, starting, they placed her on a chariot with wild horses and just sent them off um, the ledge. But God had them land safely at the bottom. Then they thought she was a witch, right? So they just put her in a small little boat and send her down the river. So let the gods take care of her, you know, but um, ironically, mm. um, St. Surf, who was a Pope, but had kind of like Pope Benedict um, said, okay, seven years was good. I'm, I'm going back to being a missionary. Mm. He happened to come across her. She's eight months pregnant at this time. So she's obviously with child. Oh um, gosh. And, and um, he uh, takes her into his community of, of um, believers that um, he has established around him. Mm -hmm. And um, she does give birth to a son, Keratin, but he always calls him Mungo, which means dear one. Mm -hmm. um, so Saint, he's Saint Mungo. He is a saint. And, and what a beautiful um, witness that um, we, every child is wanted by God, you know? I mean, I know abortion today is so easily to able to be, um, procured, and but it's not anything new. I mean, even in the Didache back in the time of the apostles, it talks about abortion, mm -hmm. and so perhaps she could have done something so her father would have never known. And um, but she knew that that was life within her, mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful story about um, how God can take a very bad thing and bring something very beautiful out of it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
her child, her son, is, is the great blessing that she received for persevering through that, for, mm-hmm. for standing up for herself. And even when nobody believed her mm-hmm. and, and didn't even care, um, she just put herself in God's hands and, and, and his hand gently leads her down, even though it was a wild ride getting down, <laughs> you know, gently let her down and let her to people who would help her. Mm. And in time, as he grows up, St. Mungo becomes a missionary like St. Surf. And he goes, like you said, and um, he becomes known as the apostle to the Britons. So um, European history would be very different if anything had happened to him, you know, St. Mungo. But, but yes. he and his mother, as he gets older, um, she travels with them. They, they spread the good news, the gospel of Jesus mm. to the Britons. Um, uh, St. Surf, by the way, he was more proselytizing. He was evangelizing the, um, the Picts. But he, uh, Mungo, goes off, off among the Britons and mm-hmm. then eventually ends in Glasgow uh, where he builds a, the first church there, which is now the site where the cathedral in Glasgow is. Mm-hmm. So um, it's the very same site where he and his mother built the very first church. And the beautiful thing about it is she persevered through all of that And eventually, God gave her her heart's desire. She ends up marrying a Welsh prince, and um, they have other children um, together. And she lives a very normal and happy life after that traumatic beginning. Yes. Um, but, but, But there's a great reward for placing your trust in God and just letting him let your story play out. And, yes. And that, that child has a purpose, a mm. mission that only he can accomplish or she and, uh, and mm. she helped him do that by bringing him into this world and then accompanying him through his journey. I love that. I think it's such a different sort of struggle. Like when you choose to be a martyr, you are making a, an actual choice in a sense. But when something happens to you and life just knocks you over in a way that you didn't plan and you have no control over, that can rock you in such a, on a deep level. And I certainly just relate to that. And I love that witness that, you may be so down, but you are not out and God is not finished with you and God is not finished with your story. And I love too, it reminds me of scripture where we just see over and over again that the poor and the disadvantaged and the, the people who are at the bottom of the, the rung as far as human uh, expectations or human ra- rankings go, uh, end up being the highest. And God just loves to do that. So yeah. what an incredible story. Uh, okay. So St. Francis of Rome, uh, what a beautiful story. Oh, she is amazing. So I loved this confessor asked her, he said, um, are you crying because you want to do God's will or because you want God to do your will, which I'm sure at the time really hit her in the heart because she had a good desire. Her desire, her will was to become a nun. And then, uh, she was not, that was not honored. And in fact, she got married to someone very rich and she was so detached from all of her material possessions. So the virtue I came up with for her is detachment, but there's so many. Uh, So can you just tell us a little bit about her story and all the incredible things that she did? Yeah. Well, um, you, you did a great job in summarizing it. She wanted to be a sister. She wanted to be a nun and um, it, it was not God's will. How did she know it wasn't God's will? Because in the time you're, you're, your family chose your spouse for you and they, they wanted her to marry. They had a good match for her, a wealthy um, suitor. And, and so, and her, she went to her confessor thinking he would take her side. And when her confessor said, no, <laughs> it's God's will that you get married. Well then it's uh. God's will. And so God <laughs> talks to us and, and guides us through other people. You know, a lot of times, the desire he puts in the heart is put there because that's what he wants us to do, but that's not always the case. And so mm-hmm. we do have to seek um, the advice, the, the wisdom of other people um, that we trust. And mm-hmm. her family was trustworthy. Her confessor was trustworthy. So she does get married. Her husband, I mean, he just doted on her. He, he truly loved her. Mm-hmm. But the life of an a aristocrat, was very difficult for her. Yeah. And um, she didn't like the fancy parties. And she, I, I don't think she really resigned herself very well to God's will because she ended up physically ill, um, laying pretty much on her deathbed. And it took a, a saint, St. Saint 
um, Alex to appear to her um, to mm-hmm. say, look, your choice is either to die <laughs> or to do God's will and do greater things still mm-hmm. uh, in this world. And even still, it took her a little bit of convincing, but she, um, yes, she eventually, um, actually, Guy gives her a friend, her sister-in-law, mm-hmm. who also has a great heart for the Lord. And he was able um, to use Saint, well, I don't know that she's a saint, but Nosa, her sister-in-law, mm-hmm. to help encourage Saint Francis of Rome. Mm-hmm. And so they kind of set up um, a rule of life where they would have time for prayer, for mass, for acts of charity, but also for entertaining, which their mother-in-law required of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they found great delight in trying to steer the gossip that the women around them would engage in to more godly things, yes. um, to still put on the party dresses that they needed to wear, but to um, be able to take them off too. And, and put on more like your street clothes and go out and help those in need when mm. that time came. So when mm. it was time to entertain, then yes, we, we get dressed up and we um, entertain and we try to lead these women into godly conversations. Mm. And, um, and when it's time to put that dress away and put on our work clothes, then we do that and we go out into the world and we serve others. And so what, mm. what a beautiful thing that God gives us sometimes um, friends, and it's important to find good, holy, spiritual friends that will help us discern God's will and encourage us, encourage us, and even walk with us on that journey. Um, I think that was a great blessing to St. Francis of Rome. Mm-hmm. Um, and she continued to do that to the, um, to, to the day that her husband died. And, and when her husband did pass, then she was able to fulfill that, that dream eventually of becoming a sister. Mm. And her detachment served her community and her family so well because she was always doing uh, acts of charity for everyone around her. And she evangelized all of the people who were in this life that otherwise could have been just totally superficial. And I think remaining detached when you have so much is so heroic in so many small ways because, you know, it's, it's sort of like a stone or sorry, a water dripping on a stone where eventually it can totally erode the stone if you're not careful, but she really maintained that detachment. Uh, And I just admire her so much. Mm -hmm. There's one quote that I just loved. Uh, Her husband, Lorenzo, on his deathbed uh, just said to her, he said, "Uh, I feel as if my whole life had been one beautiful dream of purest happiness. God has given me so much in your love. And I just, that just makes my heart so happy. Um, So as we're shopping for our Christmas gifts and, you know, really enjoying kind of all of the, the physical pleasures that come along with Christmas uh, it's just so important to remember to, to also remain detached. Yeah. yeah. So the last story that we have time for today is uh, generosity. We're not just talking a little bit. We're talking literally your life. Um, So blessed Mariana, Bernaka, did I pronounce that correctly? Bernaka. Mm-hmm. Bernaka. Okay, she was Polish, and she is one of the Polish martyrs. Another martyr story, uh, but she's the patron saint of mothers-in-law. So, why is she the patron saint of mothers-in-law, and uh, what was her story? Okay, so um, she was a, a farm girl, married a uh, farm boy, and they um, had their fa- little family farm with two sons. I mean, actually, no, a son and a daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, the daughter gets married to a city boy moves out. Um, But her son, Stanislaus, marries another little country girl, Anna. Um, And then her her husband dies. Uh, Mariana's husband dies. And she tried to remain on the family farm, but uh, just too much for her. And so Stanislaus, her son, has to go tell his newly wedded wife, Anna, Mom's moving in. <laughs> so, the words so, everybody um, wants to hear. Every, every new wife. Mm. <laughs> yay. Um, so, um, but, you know, she's such a beautiful mother-in-law. That's why she's the patron saint of mother-in-law. She's not one of those ones that goes around and, you know, dusts the furniture and, and checks your finger to see how dusty it is. Or um, <laughs> she, she truly helped around the home. She helped on the farm. Um, When Anna and Stanislaus have their first child, um, Eugenia, uh, she just dirted on that baby and and helped raise, sang songs, put her to bed. Uh, 
she just was um, very helpful and um, giving of her time and um, her service. And um, life was really, I mean, better than you would expect for a mother-in-law living in your home, right? Because she was such a pleasant woman. Mm -hmm. um, but they lived during World War II and the Nazis take over Poland. And they have a um, policy, I guess, that for every soldier killed, they kill nine, I mean, 10 citizens. So unfortunately, the, um, the re resistance uh, did kill a, a Nazi soldier. And so they randomly choose homes in which to go and, and, and pick 10 people for execution. Mm. And unfortunately, Stanislaus' home was chosen. Um, and they were going to take Stanislaus and Anna, who was at this time pregnant with their second child. Mm -hmm. And um, Eugenia was a toddler. And of course, having these soldiers storm into their house, Eugenia is crying. They're trying to drag Stanislaus and Anna out. And uh, Mariana puts herself in between the soldier and her daughter-in-law and, and says, can't you see she's pregnant? If you take her, you're not killing one but two. And have mercy on this child here, um, pointing to her granddaughter. And so... And they don't care as long as they get the 10. So they leave mm. Anna there and take Mariana instead. Um, and so Mariana in her apron pocket, she had a rosary. Mm. And it was said that she prayed it consistently until the day where she was placed before the firing squad, um, still with rosary in hand. Mm. Um, so Anna would often say, um, Eugenia, you know, would, would tell this story often. And she said, my mother would always say, that she was given life twice, once by her mother and once by her mother-in-law. So blessed Mariana Bernaka is very much like the female version of St. Maximilian Colby, where she, yes. um, her, her life of generous living um, enabled her at that moment where she had to be the most generous. And she was able to, to stand between the Nazi soldier and her daughter-in-law and say, take me instead. Yes. Oh, I don't know if you can see me over here, but I <laughs> tears in my eyes. It's so beautiful. Uh, I don't think I need to, need to add anything to that. Thank you so much for being here and for your beautiful book, which has many more stories that I would have loved to share had we more time. And I, I, if you want to buy Kelly's book, you can go get it on, where's the best place? Our Sunday Visitor? Our Sunday visitor, um, Amazon, or I have a website, none to nine. So it's none and U N, then the number two, and then N I N E, nine spelt out. Um, now, I'm not That's as great. fast as Amazon, but I can sign the book for you. So if you want a signed Ooh. book, if you go to none to nine, then I'd be happy to do that for you. Fantastic. I'll put links to all of those in the show notes for everybody. Uh, Kelly, thank you for your beautiful book, for your beautiful and inspirational work. And um, Hope to talk to you again soon. Oh my gosh, Stacey, this has been such a wonderful opportunity and, mm. and I have enjoyed very much meeting and talking with you. So thank you very much and God bless you and your family. Thank you. God bless you.